Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. So here is the Bitcoin chart. Um, I have I did not do a trading video the last couple of days because I was just so whipsawed by the market. Um, you can see my trading account here. Oh, it's that stellar. Um, I don't remember what it was in the last video, but it was around 17,000. I think I'm up a couple hundred bucks. Uh, not for lack of trying. It has been brutal. So sometimes you can be right, but not capitalize on it. That's pretty much what happened to me. Remember I called uh, 13,000 going to be the bottom. And I did uh, have my scaled in buys around that price but unfortunately kind of overthought things and over traded if that makes sense there's a lot of mistakes as Jesse Livermore says there's a lot of mistakes in the mistake playbook and I've made just about every one so uh, I want to go over my portfolio really quick it's been whittled down so I'll be able to sleep because uh, I have not been able to sleep. And unfortunately, when I have slept, almost all the moves have occurred. So I've got Florin coin, a small amount of Florin coin because I've been accumulating Florin coin under 600. This is kind of a rule that is against the technical rules. If you're talking about a fundamental trade, it's actually kind of the opposite of how you would do a technical trade. Remember I, I told you a technical trade is you want to buy things when they're going into new highs. Well you can see obviously for a very long time this has not been into new highs. Now a fundamental trade on the other, other hand is more like buy low sell high. So I kind of got a feeling, I can't really explain to you why, but I kind of got a feeling that the selling had been exhausted in this coin. I watched it for a long time, sold it up at least, well, almost 10 times where it is right now. But in Bitcoin, that's not. If there was a, well, there is a USDT chart. Um, you can just pull up the WorldCoin index. And if we pull up the WorldCoin index for flow, and you take a look at the long term, you can see it's actually in a pennant. So that's very surprising. Well, what is this, this is due mainly to the action of Bitcoin? Because again, it's denominated in Bitcoin. So. Um, I would say undervalued relative to Bitcoin. This is about the price roughly in Bitcoin that I had accumulated. I think I had like 4 million of this at one point, which I unloaded through the course of this bull market. So I'm beginning to accumulate that. I also began to accumulate library credits. And much to my surprise earlier today, we just had a huge blast off in library credits. And I actually sold right into this spike, which seemed to me just kind of ridiculous. So I, you can see I have zero I have to add to get back in. But that kept me from being negative, considering that I had built a very large position in Stellar and was just not able to hold it. Now, my theory was that based on the technicals of this chart, also based on the action of both Ripple and Litecoin, that Stellar was going to get a run. Also, Ethereum and Dash, that Stellar was going to get a run. It just didn't get a run. Stellar and Next are two that I've been watching, waiting for a breakout to happen, and it just hasn't happened on my watch. So I had to cut this position down in Stellar. I had to cut it in half, and that cost me dearly. Uh, but you have to be able to sleep at night. So let's look at what's happened to some of these coins. Again, the action in Litecoin has, has been amazing. I had a buy at 150. 
Um, I got in, I got shook out. And that's what happens when you play a very, very tight game. It's very easy for the market to shake you out. Um, I should have added to the position and added all the way up. That was a tremendous bull run. It might not even be over yet. Uh, so I was waiting on Ripple to do the same thing for a long time. I've been watching this coin for a very, very long time. And today was the day. You can see we got a nice breakout right there, 0 0.28. Uh, if you remember, I talked about Ripple in an earlier video. You can see that the in the uh, USDT chart, the high 43, we're currently at 37. So a nice cup and saucer formation there. What's my theory on this? Well, I, I think that it, Bitcoin is just sort of spreading to everything. There's our market cap for everything, 489 billion. Uh, this IOTA trade has been giving me fits. I've got half the position I had before. I did fantastic the first day. I bought in, sold, bought in again, sold. Uh, the first few days and now I'm back in a half position, but it's just not It's not acting right. So I'm probably not going to do anything more This account is about the same place as it was So for all the trading I've done which by the way, let's see on trading tier status So my 30-day trading volume is 44 Bitcoin 44 Bitcoin at 10,000 is 440,000, 17,000. So that's, yeah, I've traded about $600,000 in cryptocurrencies in the last month. So that's a lot of trading. So yes, I'm complaining because I should have a lot more money in my account, but at the same time, I'm, I'm pretty happy that I haven't lost more because I've been going through some serious whip sawing. So hopefully tomorrow morning I can do some more live trading. It'll be an active market, but I'm going to put it to bed with this position. I feel comfortable with 14,500 in USDT, uh, 0.05 in Stellar, 0.09 in Florin because it's so low in price, and 0.02, just 0.02 in Bitcoin. So that's something I can sleep on. So again, uh, what is coming up here with the coins? Um, yeah, Ripple is probably going to blast off overnight. In fact, I'll probably just buy $200 worth right now. Just so I can say I was there. So I have $200 worth of Ripple, just so I can say <laughs> I participated in it. Um, as far as the others, Vertcoin, that's low volume, that's nothing. Ripple, massive volume. Ardor, tiny volume. Decred, tiny volume. Litecoin, will it continue up? Well, you can see it's almost 0.02 Bitcoin. That's a pretty big change. Um, as far as the rest of them, there really isn't anything going on. So I'll try to cover the rest of them and what I'm doing tomorrow morning. Hopefully I'll be able to do a trading video. So let's get to some fundamental analysis uh, with silver. It's on the 30-year bond chart, but let's jump over to the silver. We're going to come back to this chart. So you can see here, long term on silver, $15.74. And that's down from the high of 2008 of $21. That's very close to the high of 2006. What is going on with silver? Well, it's, it's just simply getting killed. You can see that gold is not as unhealthy as silver. Platinum has been slaughtered as well. Copper. Palladium. So 
like I said, if you're talking about a fundamental play, then that's the exact opposite of a technical play. Um, a fundamental play is buy low and sell high. Now, the technicals will tell you that you want to sell something um, when it goes into new lows. The, the rules as far as technicals are the same on the downside as they are on the upside. If you think about support and resistance, if something is falling into new lows, then new all-time lows, then nobody's at a profit, right? Although usually it's come from a price lower than that. So we'll say nobody recently is at a profit. So there's a lot of doom and gloom here in silver, you can see. Uh, that's a very, very bearish technical picture. But at the same time, if you have a reason and if you believe in the fundamentals, which I do, I still do as much as ever, if you believe in the fundamentals, then that's actually a very, very bullish technical picture. I know that's contradictory, but one is primarily short-term trading, the other one is long-term investing. And yes, you can do both. And in fact, both are in Market Wizards. If you read the interview with Jimmy Rogers, he'll tell you that he's the worst market timer in the world. But he's a fantastic fundamental investor. He buys things when they're undervalued. He sells them when they're overvalued. Sometimes he'll sell things when they're overvalued even though he doesn't own it. Like he'll short things outright, but it's very difficult to short everything. So those two are not incompatible concepts. Uh, and my position is that why not be both? Why can't one person be both a short-term trader and a long-term investor? So I try to incorporate both of those, but it's very difficult. Now, speaking of the fundamentals, let's look at the fundamentals in the bonds, because this is a, a striking chart that I was looking at here. So I'm going to take you to the two-year note. Now, for the longest time, we thought that we were not going to get a downtrend in this market. You can see that it was absolutely sick as far as uh, interest rates were sick. Uh, the the thing was just about pegged at 110. You can see that it's it's it hit 110 back in late 2010, and it was still at 110 in 2015. That's five years straight of super super low interest rates. So now that it's starting to come off that, what does that mean? Well, the first comparison I want to make, I want to have you look at is these three trends. So you can see that we've had two downtrends in the past in the price of this uh, treasury. You can see that starting in 1998 at the top of the dot-com bubble, uh, Greenspan with his rational exuberance speech, they began to ratchet up interest rates and the bond market crashed, short-term bonds crashed. Then the Fed panicked, lowered interest rates drastically, and you can see the result in the two-year note. Huge bull market from early 2000 all the way to about 2003. Then in 2003, we went through the same sort of thing. The Fed got panicky about uh, prices of things and markets running away, started raising interest rates. This time, they were more gradual in the way they raised interest rates, and you can see what happened. It went from 2003 all the way down to 2006, mid-2006, even mid-2007, and finally, all the markets gave way, and you know what happened. We had the Great Recession, and then you can see this interest rates drastically dropped and then kept dropping past those old uh, lows or highs as far as the price goes and then up to that ceiling of that 210 number 
and now we're finally coming off it. So you can see we're coming off it in a slower pace than ever. Uh, what does that portend? Well, if, the, if this pattern holds, we'd have to say this was a, a halfway decent crash, this was a massive crash, and this will be a global crash would be one way you could look at these numbers. Now another way you can look at these numbers is to jump over to the 30-year bond. And when we do so, what's interesting is this same sort of pattern, I think you would have a problem picking it out. Now we know because we remember the years that I gave was 1998 down to 2000 and then 2000 to 2003, 2003 to 2007, but see in the 30-year bond how it just doesn't match the two-year note at all. Do you see that? You'd be hard-pressed to find that pattern in the 30-year bond. Now what is the 30-year bond? Well, the 30-year bond was how the government funded its debt. It no longer is. I think it's mainly been retired. I think this is synthetic. But you can use the 10-year note as a proxy for the 30-year bond. And you can see here, looking at the 10-year note, same sort of thing. Interest rates have not ratcheted up that much. The market has not fallen off that much. And you can see it's much, much higher than it was in the past. Now, you can see here on the two-year note, the price of the two-year note is a decent amount lower than it was in 2003 at the beginning of the uh, last cycle. And also, we're actually matching up to prices that we had in 1998 on the two-year note. Now, if you compare the 30-year bond, you can see here in 98, we're nowhere near those prices. Well, what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is that they can't let it rise. And this is the reason why, the national debt. Here's one from Washington Examiner just a few hours ago. Meet the new debt ceiling, $20.493 trillion. The federal government is bumping up against the new borrowing limit, one that was imposed at the end of Friday. The debt ceiling was suspended for about three months in September which allowed the federal government to borrow as much money as it needed during that period. The government borrowed more than $500 billion in the last few months when the ceiling was suspended. So do you see that pattern that they have there? So what they're doing is they're suspending the debt limit and then running up as much debt as they need to make it through a time period and then maybe socking away some money and then closing it down again. Why the charade? Well, Part of it is just a game that they're playing, but part of it is they have to keep up some semblance of confidence in the dollar, in the treasuries. Even though they're rigging both, they have to keep a semblance of sanity. So they do things like this. But after Friday, the debt ceiling took effect once more. The new limit is $20.493 trillion, which government, a government website said on Monday was the total amount of accrued debt as of Friday. Now, the total national debt will sit at or around $20.493 trillion until Congress agrees to increase or suspend the ceiling again. That's not expected to happen until March or April. Until then, the Treasury Department is expected to reduce borrowing and undertake other extraordinary measures to ensure borrowing doesn't exceed the new limit. The national debt remains a contentious issue among Republicans. Some Republicans oppose the GOP bill to cut taxes since it is expected to add more than $1 trillion to the national debt over the next decade. Okay, so this is the type of reporting that you have on the fake news sites. Okay, and I pointed this out so many times before. Cutting taxes does not add to the national debt. Spending adds to the national debt. Think of it as, you, as if it were your household budget. So let's say that you have a certain amount of accumulated credit card debt and you've been bringing in $80,000 a year for the last 10 years, but you get laid off. And you get a new job and it only pays $60,000 a year. 
So the eleventh year after earning eighty thousand and spending eighty thousand, a little bit more, you've accumulated a little bit of credit card debt. Let's say you've got ten thousand dollars in credit card debt over those ten years. But now you've been laid off and got a new job and you've taken a twenty thousand dollar a year pay cut. So is that pay cut, which is essentially the same as taxes because that's your revenues, that's the government's revenues. A $20,000 cut. Well, what do most people do? Most people have to, because they don't have a printing press, cut their expenses. So you know that your income has gone down by $20,000 a year starting the year that it started. So what are you going to do? You're going to tighten your belt. So let's say you do tighten your belt and bring your expenses down to 50,000. They've been running 81, 80, 81, 82 for 10 years and you'd accumulated $10,000 debt, but you see the writing on the wall. You cut your expenses the next year down to 50,000 and even though you only bring in 60,000, uh, you actually have $10,000 in savings, which was your accumulated debt and now you end up with no debt. So there's an example of a person who paid off their debt uh, by taking a 25% revenue cut. So this is a complete lie and of course the reason why they tell this lie all the time is because they there's one thing they don't want to talk about and that is cutting government spending. I don't know how many times I've said that it's a broken record. That's the one thing they will never talk about is cutting government spending and that's why they bring out this nonsense about tax cuts uh, increasing the debt the only thing that increases the debt is more spending so let's get back to the markets uh, I was right very right on the bounce 13,000 is what we were looking at I did not successfully capitalize on that and that just has to go down to write it off to one of those experiences. That's what happens when you trade, um, especially when you try to run very, very tight stops and not take a loss. And I have not taken a significant loss in probably the last thousand trades. So that's, that's the price you pay. Where are we going from here? I think we're going higher. How high? I can't say. Uh, Technically, it looks like a bull market. It is a resumption of a parabolic uptrend. Parabolic trends have to continue upwards or they stall, just like an airplane going into a stall, and they turn and they go straight down. So again, I'm pretty much hedged except for one super cheap coin in my opinion and one um, breakout play. Uh, big moves in Ripple, big moves in Litecoin. Unfortunately, we didn't get any of that action, but uh, we're going to be here tomorrow morning doing some live trading, and we'll talk to you next time.